Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. This is a podcast we are recording remotely. We are practicing good, healthy social distancing from one another. We are also video recording this for those of you who uh, dare to wonder what it looks like when the four of us are together uh, working on text to see how alert we are. So this you want to listen to this as an audio podcast, as usual, you may, but also posted with that is a link to our YouTube channel where this is also being done uh, by video, which is uh, terrifying to me, to be perfectly honest. The texts for this podcast are for Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday, but we are going to look at the Passion Sunday texts. Isaiah 50, 4 through 9a, Psalm 31, 9 through 16. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 27, 11 through 54. Hi, everybody. You're all looking good. Hi, Matt. How you doing? Um, I'm great. I got lots yeah. of books behind me just to show off. It's really just wallpaper. It's, they aren't actual books. I do this to look <laughs> smart. Um, the rest of you look hey all there. pretty comfortable. I've so, got my I, clock. I, I've got my clock. <laughs> and your and your widescreen TV, great, good to see. So every I mean, by the time people are listening or viewing this, everybody's used to doing remote preaching of some kind. I assume people who are preaching. Uh, so maybe we need to talk less about the hows or the techniques of new preaching delivery. But what are we going to do with these texts? These very familiar texts on an incredibly important Sunday of the year, one people have been looking forward to for a long time, but now are celebrating together under very different circumstances. Uh, we should probably point out too, we don't record, we're not recording this right up until Palm Sunday. So we're also wondering what the world will be like uh, when this podcast is actually being viewed and listened to. So. Sounds different, doesn't it? Listen to the passion narrative during a time of pandemic. Indeed. It does. <laughs> it really does. And I think, uh, you know, uh, one thing that I was uh, drawn to, uh, and I, I think actually I, I, I've, I've talked about this in the, in the past, but uh, you know, the event of the, the death of Jesus is uh, where the earth shook and the rocks were split. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering how many people are feeling that same thing, where just feeling like uh, a constant state of the earth shaking, um, maybe not literally, but metaphorically, where uh, everything on which we have grounded, literally, uh, how we go about in the world and what we assume and what we, you know, what we really uh, take for granted is uh, is no longer beneath our feet, and uh, and so that's maybe a metaphor. I would uh, I, I've talked about it before, as I said in the past. I know, but I think I would maybe uh, uh, explore it a little differently this year. Of what does it uh, what does it mean to uh, be in a place where that that footing is is no longer, and but yet there's also some connection to uh, the death of the death of Jesus and that, and uh, so I would do something with that. And even the death of Jesus for uh, those followers who had found um, comfort, hope, um, uh, a promise uh, of God being kept. Uh, to have Jesus um, be, become the enemy of the state um, disrupts everything of their reality. And how do we take that journey of watching what seems to be the crash, um, literally, of, uh, for them, the last three years of, uh, of, of, their, of their reality? Um, you know, this is, uh, we're handing Jesus over. We're uh, taking this uh, journey where he is returning to Jerusalem. And we know that, that this, is, um, this is the place where he, his uh, very being is most threatened. It, that, that should be real for us today. 
uh, this uh, under these circumstances and to uh, help folks to recognize the reality of the past um, again as they hear what seems like such a familiar story. We do this every year and yet we do this every year because we need to know that um, this is not the first time that um, God's people or the world has been a uh, seen disruption and that the calm of Jesus throughout this is the calm that Christ-like followers um, can can enact if we keep the faith. That's that's what I, where I would go. It seems right that the year A texts are what we're what we're with right now because it's such a desolate story. Uh, it's such a story that seems to have so little hope the way Matthew tells it. I mean, Matthew builds on Mark, which is also a very dismal account of Jesus' experience. Matthew makes it even worse, I think, by having uh, both high priest or chief priests, high priest, and Pilate being all the more cynical and unable to understand what's going on. Uh, Matthew makes it more difficult in, in, in some ways with the um, just the sense of missed opportunity that's around this. Pilate could have figured something out. We assume the, the, the temple leaders could have. So it's just such a depressing story on so many levels with that one little weird aspect of hope with the rocks shaking and the, and the earthquake. But there's also one more. And so what I would do this year, if I were being asked to preach on this Sunday, I would actually get ready for it, add two verses. So I know you're all, they're stunned. Trust me, they're just muted. But the, uh, the story, this, the, 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 the lection ends off just before Matthew introduces the fact that Jesus was not entirely alone or was not entirely without uh, allies during his death. But we are introduced to these women who were watching from a distance and who had always been part of his ministry, which is this odd narrative moment where now all of a sudden we're introduced to people who were part of the story all along. We just had never heard about them. And we've been, we've been taken to watch this scene of the execution of this man, thinking he's totally alone, thinking everybody who's watching is just deriding him and mocking him. And now we get a sense that there are witnesses who will have a role to play later on, which in some ways seems to fit this moment where the church cannot be as active and visible and public in the same way as it used to be, but the church is nevertheless watching everything, uh, in some ways from a distance, in some ways virtually, we're right there. Uh, but because we're going to have a role to play, right, when the time is right. Um, and that's what the women, I think, were doing in this scene. They couldn't be right there or wouldn't be right there at the foot of the cross, as Matthew describes it. But they're going to be utterly essential for what's going to happen when Easter comes. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that's really important. Um, I love that. And uh, I, I love that you're adding verses, Matt. <laughs> We finally convinced you. That's a good yeah, idea. Know. There's only like 45 <laughs> verses or something in the reading. We're not right. Two more. You know what? What's two more? Uh, but but I mean, what you're pointing to is uh, that the the reality of presence in a in a virtual reality of non-presence is part of what we're happening. What's happening now, and so that we look for. Uh, the ways in which we are indeed surrounded, uh, and and yet uh, and yet uh, it, it looks it looks bleak, and it doesn't look like that's possible. I think you know another. I think one of the one of the things that you've pointed out uh, about this, um, Matt, is you have to kind of a, a time like this sort of requires a little bit of uh, hermeneutical. Um, dexterity, if you will. And you look for the places that uh, that would you would kind of overlook in normal circumstances, but do indicate a kind of uh, hope and even God's presence. And I go to verse 19, uh, where you have yet another woman, uh, a woman's role in this, which is the wife of Pilate, uh, have nothing to do with that innocent man, which is uh, better translated, right, have nothing to do with that righteous man uh, or that righteous one. And so that should immediately take you back to uh, the 
the Sermon on the Mount and and this theme of righteousness throughout the entire uh, Gospel of Matthew and 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 how is it that uh, how it how is it that God's righteousness is now um, is now made manifest in this way. Uh, and I think that could be another uh, another direction, and that uh, that that she mentions that this is in a dream, uh, which should take you back to chapter two, and uh, the dream to Joseph. And so you have these sort of uh, you know subtle indications of God at work that you you uh, as as Barbara Brown Taylor uh, says uh, you have to be almost like a a detective of divinity in these circumstances where you're where you're seeing God uh, and that's what the preacher's job is right is to point out those places where God is present that that when we're when when life is normal if you will when we're going about our regular lives as if you know we didn't have anything to think about there those are the details those are the places that are easy to pass over but we're not in that kind of place right now you know, the moment in the text uh, of the, of if it's the Matthew 27 pa uh, long passion reading that, that spoke to me is the, is the moment uh, when um, P Pilate offers to release Jesus or Barabbas and, and the crowd picks Barabbas. And I was reminded of a, of a election day uh, sermon that Stanley Hauerbas gave at Duke that's been posted around the internet. And, uh, and Harbaugh says this about that. He says, um, you need to remember that there was a democratic moment in the Gospels and the people asked for Barabbas. That um, in our culture in the United States, we're in the midst of a contentious election season, in the midst of all the pandemic moments. So, and so I was reminded of Harbaugh's comment about this, so this election moment. And then uh, Harvas goes on to say, you know, we did not elect Jesus to be president. We did not elect Jesus to be the second person of the Trinity. We did not elect him Messiah or Savior. And then he ends uh, by flipping that uh, in sort of a predictable homiletical move. God elected us uh, in, in our tradition, we would say, in our baptism. Um, uh, I think that that might be a, a way to have the text speak into the moment with that election scene. Um, and if you don't use it uh, Sunday, uh, you could always use it uh, on, on Good Friday, uh, which is, is another podcast. But um, that's, the, that's the way the text kind of, I felt, speaking into my reality. Um, I, 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 was, I can't remember if it was Joy or Matt at the start or Caroline, which one of you was talking just about this, this um, the feeling that... Um, the earth has changed around us, you know, it just, uh, uh, and, and there's a, this, a sense of betrayal almost uh, that also kind of speaks, uh, makes this text speak into it that it, you know, that you can't trust to touch somebody anymore. And uh, you might act to be, you, you know, you might be carrying the virus and accidentally infect um, someone you love. Uh, and if it's like me, that I have elderly parents, um, you know, and so the social distancing is a way to love the other right now um, so that you don't accidentally infect somebody who's really vulnerable. But then that uh, makes it really difficult um, how to positively, I mean, that's like, there's do's and do nots to, to loving the neighbor. In this, in this case, you shall not touch, you shall not touch anybody, you know, but then how do you, what's the do that uh, takes place, you know? Um, Churches are uh, and blocks are organizing to get uh, food out uh, out to their neighbors. Um, I'm getting away from the text, obviously now, but I'm just uh, thinking about how how it is that, in a sense of uh, where nature has betrayed us, um, how do we react? I think that that's on the minds of so many people, Ralph, and we need to keep that um, uh, um, a, a for, a front and center when we're thinking of how uh, we're going to be heard as we, as we address this. You know, that makes me think of the Philippians text, which kind of maybe going out of sequence here, where Jesus' own condescension is, is an act of obedience 
for the sake of another. And so it's this really high mind, it's this really kind of high theological in the sense of, you know, theologians run to this passage to talk about incarnation and Trinity and the, the nature of Jesus' death. But notice it starts, verse five, this is Philippians two, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. That, that Paul, Paul goes to this Christ hymn as a way of telling the Philippians how he wants them to act. And so what does it mean to put one's own interests aside, you know, for the sake of an other? But also I think the way in which obedience is difficult, and I think it's been difficult in my circumstances, not knowing always who to listen to or, or what does that look like or could it really be that bad? And there's a lot of ways in which the moment of our current situation has relied us to trust on things that we can't see or on expertise mm -hmm. that we don't necessarily have uh, at our own fingertips, which is an interesting way of thinking in some ways about obedience and what that experience is like uh, for Jesus himself and how the, how the, for me, the passion sounds really different. If Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen and it's easy for him and it's all a plan, Unfortunately, the biblical witness doesn't really present it like that, right? He begs in Golgotha to be delivered from this moment. There's nothing about any future knowledge that makes crucifixion easier for him or more pleasant for him or something he would choose. And so just to kind of get a little bit into that, so we have a deeper sense of the love of God through Christ is not a love that's easy, uh, even though it might be freely chosen or even though... Uh, God might be God and, and available more information than I am. I, I really appreciate you taking us to the Philippians text. Um, it's a text that um, is more and more meaningfully to me the, the older I get and the longer I think about it. And correct me if I'm wrong, especially uh, Matt and Caroline, but my understanding is that... I want Joy to correct you if you're wrong. The, so, uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask a question about Greek. That's why I... Um, specifically asked uh, the two of you. The New Testament folks to do it? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the NRSV translation is, let the same mind be among you that was in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God. Uh, my understanding is there, there, there really isn't a though. It, I mean, the, the text sort of says, like, you know, even, um, even though he was in the form of God, he kind of gave up the form of God, you know, uh, gave up his, you know, godliness or whatever. Um, and emptied himself, uh, but it could act, it could actually be this: being in the form of God. This is what he did. That it, it's 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 not inconsistent with God's nature to um, become incarnate in a suffering uh, reality, but it's actually consistent with God's nature. Being in the very form of God. This is what God did. Yeah, joy. There's that mute button. I would I would uh, ag agree with that uh, interpretation of it. I I don't have um, my Greek Bible right at my hand, um, but uh, I I think that that is the power of the incarnation in and itself, and that um, Jesus that God in Jesus is coming into the broken, violent, um, uh, betraying world. Um, uh, to restore it to um, uh, with a hope that the circumstances that uh, we are, find ourselves in is one not God's intention and two because God has um, a, a better uh, desire for us God will become vulnerable to make that good our reality again um, I, I like that um, choice of words Ralph um, now we'll let the New Testament folks tell me if I need to refer to my Greek, but I think that's exactly what the incarnation is all about. Well, I, 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 you're right on there, Joy. I mean, it, it because there is no though. Uh, it's uh, it is uh, who uh, who existed in the form of God, or who uh, who was in the form of God, uh, and. So I think that 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 revelation there is uh, it is is what both you Joy and Rolf are making is that uh, Jesus is Jesus is not um, 
uh, this is not something that Jesus is taking on. Incarnation is not necessarily something that Jesus is just taking on, as it is uh, it, it, uh, an expression of God, of God, God's self. Yes. And uh, and so there's something uh, ex that kind of recognition, particularly now in what we are in, in 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 where we are and what we're dealing with, of that that just unbelievable radical solidarity of God. Uh, with us, I think is uh, really powerful. I think it's a text we want to see in, in from two dimensions. I mean, the the Greek, obviously, we're, we're all on the same page that the Greek doesn't demand it to be, although although it could be. I mean, it's one of the possible, like, like concessive translation of just a simple participle there. Had to throw that in there. Uh, that made me feel my heart was strangely warm. That's good. I, we're all trying to help each other in these hard times. So, uh, and that'll preach. That'll preach online. Talk about a concessive participle. But um, I am never... so feeling that I am influencing you. I mean, we have a Wesleyan warm heart, and I've only been here a few months, and Matt is adding vo verses. This is good. It is good. It is good. We're going to turn Rolf into an Anabaptist soon, I think. It's a little more, a little more work. There you go. The uh, when I say it's two ways, I think that obviously the translators decided the although because of what Paul's contrasting here, this idea of a God versus a slave, which again, to put that in the context of the kinds of gods they're worshiping in Philippi, or they were worshiping in Philippi, the members of the church were. Uh, this is dramatic. Gods aren't anything like slaves. Gods are all about power, all about their ability to exert dominance over others and over other forces. And so some ways, Paul is rewriting for them the notion of what divinity looks like. The, the second, I said, you know, kind of two perspectives. The other perspective is, yes, of course, Paul has, as a, as, as a Christ follower, has now come to see this notion of incarnation and humility as utterly in line with who the God of Israel is, was, and always has been. So it's, that's my, that's my take on, yeah. uh, on where to go with that. I don't think it's necessarily yeah. a wrong translation, but it's one that becomes all the more interesting when we look at the way in which um, Paul has, uh, is trying to say this is, this is not, this is not a one-off for God, right? This is the way God operates. Mm -hmm. it's, who God, it's who God is, yeah. Uh, as we come to a close here with this podcast for Passion Sunday, uh, I, I, I want to, suggest to preachers out there that you know of course every time you come to your weekly preaching you look at these texts and think okay how can i preach them how can i preach them how can i preach them and there's that you know that um obviously that homiletical urgency uh but maybe in the times that we are now uh maybe you make it a a discipline if you will not necessarily to go to every text and say okay how can i preach this but what is how what is this text saying to me what is this text how is this text speaking to me how can i take this text this week uh and not worry about how i should preach it uh what i should say about it but just pray it uh or just live it or just be it and that's uh so maybe this week it's the psalm it's psalm 31 9 to 16 be gracious to me lord for i am in distress so maybe preachers out there, just pray that, pray that every day this week and, um, and rest in verse 14, but I trust in you, O Lord. And, and be encouraged that uh, the text from Isaiah says that morning by morning, God gives us, and I'm taking a verse five, uh, a verse four, reading it backwards, uh, morning by morning, God gives us the tongue of a teacher that we may sustain the weary with a word.